Well, this morning we're looking at one of the kingdom parables that's found in Matthew chapter 25. That was in your reading this week through the New Testament, chapters 21 through 25, a lot that we covered this week in that reading. Matthew 24 and 25 is a section that's called the Olivet Discourse. Jesus was on the Mount of Olives, apparently with just the disciples. Um, if you've been doing your reading, you know that this week they asked him, uh, what's, the, what's the sign of your coming? What's the sign of the second coming? What, what's the end of the age? What does that look like? And five different times he told them and tells us, no man knows the day or the hour. Now, he does tell them signs to watch for. You saw that in your reading, especially in, in chapter 24. Uh, he encouraged them to be ready. In chapter 25, you're going to see two parables, the uh, parable of the ten virgins and the parable that we're looking at this morning, the parable of the talents. Both of those emphasize the importance of watchfulness and, and faithful waiting. And you'll notice they're followed at the end of chapter 25 by the parable of the sheep and the goats. That time at the end when the, the division will come between the saved and the unsaved. They'll be divided out. Well, Jesus wanted his followers then and now to live in a, in a state of anticipation of his coming. To constantly um, be ready. And the parable of the ten virgins and the parable of the talents kind of gives us that balance between watching and anticipating he's coming and, and working and making the most of the time and the opportunity while we have it. The parable of the talents reminds me of Paul's word in Ephesians 5, 15, and 16, where he said, Be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Time is going to run out, and we need to make the most of the opportunities that the Lord has given us. Well, verse 13 in Matthew 25 is kind of the bridge or the connection between these two parables. You notice in verse 13, he says, Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. What is he saying? Be alert. Literally, watch means to stay awake. Now, obviously, he's not talking about staying awake physically, but to be awake spiritually. Be careful that you're not lulled into complacency. And this is especially important because, as he told the disciples, no one knows the day or the hour, but he made clear to them that there would be some time that would pass, and they needed to be careful not to be lulled into complacency. So be ready for his coming, and being ready includes being working, being busy as we're ready for his coming. Let's read the rest of the, of the uh, parable there in verse 14, going down through verse 30. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability, and then he went away. He had received the five talents, went at once and traded them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more, but he had received the one talent, dug in the ground, and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of the servants came, and he settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And also he who had the two talents came forward and said, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, and I have made two talents more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who'd received the one talent came forward saying, master, I knew you to be a hard man reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has been given, for, to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So here's the story. A man's going on a journey. Now, he's not going to get on a plane and be home in a week. He's going on a long journey. It may be months, more likely a year, could be even as much as two years that he's going to be gone. And this was very common in that day. Now, obviously, Jesus is the man in the story. He's letting the disciples know it's going to be a while uh, before he comes again. He's already warned them in chapter 24, don't let the delay 
cause you to deviate from the task. So the man's going on the journey. It says he calls in his servants. Who are his servants? There are people in his domain, in his kingdom. There are people that, that have served him. He knows them. He understands them. They know him. Uh, they understand or they know what is required. And he's going to be gone for a long time. So someone has to keep the business going. Someone has to be in touch uh, with, with the economy and keep production going and make sure that everything is cared for in his absence because he cannot do that from the distance where he's going to be. Now, you notice it says that he entrusted his property to servants. Don't get the idea that these were low-level, menial task slaves. These servants were people who had some skills. Uh, these servants were people who had a mind for the, the master's business. They, they could produce, and he needed them to handle his assets and keep the production going in his absence. Look at verse 15. It says, he gave to the one five, gave to, gave one. That doesn't mean he relinquished ownership. What he gave was gave them control or gave them stewardship. He gave them the opportunity to take what he had and, and bring in more. What did he give them? He gave them talents. Now, that word could confuse you. In our English language, um, talents for us means a, a special ability. Now, it's not wrong to look at this proverb and say, well, God wants us to use the, the abilities he's given us, our God-given abilities in his service to grow his kingdom. That's not a wrong view, but listen, Jesus, when he uses the term talents in their day, a talent was a unit of money. Now, we don't know how much money. Talent referred to weight. It was a certain weight of money. It literally, he had some, some, some bags of coins, and he gave one a, a weight of five talent, one the weight of two talent, one the weight of one talent. We don't know the value. The coins could have been gold. They'd have been very high value. Could have been silver. Could have been copper. We don't know. And the reason we don't know is the value, the monetary value, is not what's important. What's important is what they did with what he gave them, not how much they had. It says that he gave each according to his ability. You know, no one's the same, right? We're created differently. All of us in this room have different skills, different talents, different capacities, different capabilities. We're, we're all different. So these servants were also different. But let's go a little bit deep and understand that because this parable has a spiritual application, we're not only different in, in how we're created, but we're different in our spiritual capabilities. Why is that? Well, you think all of us have been exposed to different opportunities along the course of our journey. We've been exposed to different teachers, different levels of instruction, different discipling processes. That's why the Lord in this parable differs in what he gives and what he expects. Listen, everyone is not expected to perform at the same level. Everyone is not expected to perform at the same level. But everyone is expected to do their very best as a faithful steward. Let me tell you this morning, if, if you're a one you feel like you're a one, you know you're a one, it's good to be a one. Just make sure that, that as a one, you do everything you can. It's not about the value in our eyes of what we have, but it's about using what we've been given. Let me illustrate that this morning. Let's see, let's have um, Chloe, and let's have Brad, and let's have, yeah, come on, you raise your hand, come on. Come on up, right up here. I'm going to share with you something I learned early on in ministry, and it's the, the parable of the buckets. Here you go, Brad. You get that little bucket. Get that bucket. That bucket. Okay, y'all y'all spread it right here and face the crowd. Come here, Chloe. Right up here. Brad, right here. All right. You may get frustrated because you think, well, I don't have a lot to do for the kingdom. But what God wants, whether you're a five or a two or a one, what God wants is simply for you to fulfill what he has for you to do. Now, Brad, <laughs> Brad's just a, a one. He's a one-talent kind of guy, okay? So he's got a one-gallon bucket. Chloe's a two. What's your name? Brody. Brody. Have we ever met before? No, that's, that's just if we're doing a magic trick. It's okay. All right, Brody has a five. So Brad and Chloe and Brody, a one, a two, and a five. Now, God expects Brad to do how much? One. 
Expects Chloe to do how much? Expects Brody to do how much? Five. What if Brad does one and Chloe does one? Is God pleased with Brad? Is he pleased with Chloe? No, they did the same amount. What if Brad does one, Chloe does two, and Brody does three? Brody's done as much as both of them combined, but is God pleased with Brody? No, because Brody's a five, right? So if you're a five, God expects a five. If you're a two, God expects a two. If you're a one, God expects a one. And he gives, it says he gives each according to his abilities. Does it mean that Brad is not as important in the kingdom of God because he's only one? No. Brad is important in the kingdom of God when he's a one and he fills his bucket. He fills it with one. You see, if God gave a one a five challenge, he's going to get overwhelmed and frustrated and shut down. If God gave a five only a one challenge, that's his ability, but he only gets a one, he's going to get frustrated, and he's going to get lazy, and he's not going to accomplish what God has for him. So once you understand the parable of the buckets and get this in your mind as you consider your service in the kingdom, a one, a two, and a five, what's important is not whether you're a five or a one or a two, what's important is what you do with what God has given you, that you fill your bucket. If you're a one, fill it up. If you're a two, two. If you're a five, five, fill it up. That's what God's called you to do. Y'all can set those down right there. Thanks for helping me. God knows what he's doing. And whether I'm a, I'm a five or a two or a one, my attitude needs to be, based on what God has given me, I want to please the master. I want to show the master that I'm faithful. I want to show the master that I'm trustworthy. And I want the master to, to experience my love and appreciation for all that he's done for me and the ways that he's blessed me. And because of that, I'm going to fill my bucket. Can I tell you this morning, as we're all gathered here, there's probably in, in this room and, and in the venue as well, there's probably a pretty wide variety of IQs in this room. A lot of us are kind of in the middle, some at either end. There's probably a pretty wide variety of IQs. But you know what I would say? There's also a very wide variety of SQs. What am I saying? Spiritual quotients. We're all different. Just as these servants were all different, one was a five and, and one was a two and, and one was a one, because of our wide variety of spiritual experiences, we're all different. And let me mention to you this morning, you may not know how to tap into and figure out your, your spiritual gifts, and you may not know what to do with the blessings and the skills and the, and the privilege that God has given you. You know that we have a class simply called SERVE, S-E-R-V-E, and the whole purpose of that class is to help people who are followers of Christ that really don't know where to put what God has given them into service. They don't know how to do that. That's what that class is for. In that class, you look at your, your spiritual gifts. If you don't know what your gift is, they, they help you discover your gift. And you look at your personal style, how you operate. Some of us are people people. Some of us are task people. You, you look at your passions for ministry, what really makes your heart beat, and you find the best place of service, whether you're a one or whether you're a two or whether you're a five. I'm about to say something that may cause some of you to leave this church. Because I'm about to lay some heavy responsibility on you, and you may say, well, I don't want that. Do you recognize if you've been a part of, of Geyer Springs, if you've been a part of this church for some time, you have been given incredible spiritual blessing? Do you know that for over 50 years, and I don't know prior to 52 years ago because that's the last pastor that I knew, but for over 50 years, the preaching, I'm not just talking about me, the pastors that have been a part of this church, leading this church the last 50 years, have been incredibly faithful to the Word of God, and they have incredibly, they've been incredibly faithful at teaching the Word as it is, no fluff, no feel-good stuff, no tickle your ears. They have faithfully preached the Word of God. If you've been around here, you've had that incredible spiritual blessing. You've had the blessing, if you're in a small group, uh, of some solid teaching. You've had the blessing of, of lots of opportunity for discipleship, mission trips, and all the different things that we do. If you're a part of this church family and you've been here for some time, God has blessed you at a five. And God has given us an incredible opportunity here at Geyer Springs to honor and bless the master because he has prepared us well. 
All right, you've got to listen a lot faster. We're only through two verses, and there's 17 verses here. So look at, look at verse 16, just one phrase. It says that when the master um, gave them, he gave the one the five talents, it says that he went at once. You know, one word to, to say those three words, he went at once, immediately. Immediately, as soon as the master gave him the assignment, he immediately went out and used what he had and invested it for his master. Hey, where have we heard recently that, that same word immediately? Do you remember? It's in last month's memory verse, Matthew 4, 19. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Next word, immediately they left their nets and followed him. Listen, let me just say a quick word about obedience here. It's the proper response to any instruction from the master to obey. And obedience is always immediate. Delayed obedience is disobedience. When God calls us to something, we should immediately obey. So what happened? The five went out, he made five more. The one with two went out, he made two more. They had the same opportunity. You might look at it and say, well, no, their opportunities were different. Look, this was a five, this was a two. No, they had the same opportunity. God gave them and trusted them according to their abilities. They had the same opportunity, and they had the same degree of faithfulness. The five made five, the two made two. The same degree of faithfulness. We're to be faithful very simply, whether a one or a two or a five. We're simply to be faithful in maximizing the opportunity that God has given us. And then there's the one. Can I tell you that the guy with the one talent also had the same opportunity? He had a hundred percent. He could have gotten a hundred percent return. He had the same opportunity. Why is it the same opportunity? Because as a one, he's not required to make a five. He's only required to make a one. It was the same opportunity. He could have gotten just as easily as the five and the two. He could have gotten a hundred percent return. Verse 19, it says, after a long time, we don't, we don't know how long, again, Jesus' return is not specified. You know, I wonder sometimes, would it really matter if we knew the day and the hour? If we knew the day and the hour that Jesus was going to return, would that affect how we live life? I think not. I remember in, in, uh, in early high school, uh, my stepfather sometimes would go to work on a Saturday, and before he would leave Saturday morning, he'd say, hey, I want the yard mowed before I get home from work. And sometimes I would know exactly what time he was coming home. But I'd spend half the day inside, watching TV, reading, doing whatever. And I'd try to calculate. Okay, if he's coming home at 3, it's going to take me this long. I'd try to calculate how close I could cut it to get that yard done. And I always forgot how hard it was to mow over the septic tank. <laughs> if you've got a septic tank, you know what I'm talking about, right? Always forgot that. The master was gone for a long time. He came back, and it says in verse 19, he, he settled accounts. What does that mean? There was a reckoning. Man, I know what a reckoning is. I had a few of those over that yard. A reckoning. He settled accounts. He took a look at the books, and, and after looking at the books, that's followed by reward or payment, and that, that can be positive or negative. You remember we saw last week in Matthew 16, verse 27, it says, The Son of Man will return in his glory. And then he'll reward each one, what? According to what he has done, how he's lived his life. Same thing we're seeing here. There's a reckoning. Well, look at verses 20 through 23. Let me, let me very quickly summarize the master's dealings with the first two so we can get on to the third servant. You notice the response to the five-talent servant and the two-talent servant is exactly the same. He says the exact same thing to them. And actually, in the Greek, it's just a two-letter word, E and a U, and it just means excellent. To the one who made five, he said, excellent. To the one who made two, he said, excellent. There was no distinction in their reward. Why? Because it wasn't about different levels of production. It was about their faithfulness. They were faithful. Because they were faithful, he said, excellent. Look what he said. You've been faithful in little things. I will set you over much. You know what little things are? Little things are the things of the world. They were taking care of, of, of the worldly business of the master. Those were little things. What does he mean when he says, I will set you over much? It's talking about heavenly things. 
Do you know that here is prep for there? Do you know that you're going to work and you're going to rule and you're going to reign in heaven? Did you know that? Hey, let me ask you a question this morning. How many of you, how many of you know how to play the harp? Let me see your hands. That's okay, because you know what? In heaven, you're not going to be sitting around on fluffy clouds playing a harp. That's not what we're going to do. What you're going to do in heaven, it's going to be a time of service. You know, I don't know if you've ever realized this. You haven't unless you've really gotten into it. Serving the Lord here is the greatest joy that you can have. And we serve him perfectly. So listen, when you enter into the master's joy, when, when you get to heaven and you're in his presence and you're in the place of ultimate joy, one of the things that's going to bring you ultimate joy is rendering ultimate service because your service in heaven is going to be perfect and you're serving your master. What you do in eternity is determined by what you do here. Now, before we unpack the accounting with the, with the one-talent servant, let me mention to you, this accounting with this one-talent servant is referring to the separation of believers and unbelievers. If you look down in your text, you see the very next thing that follows this parable is the parable of the sheep and the goats, where the judgment is coming uh, on, on those whom the Father does not know. Basically, the, the parable of the sheep and the goats is elaborating on the outcome of this third servant, this one talent servant. So, so here he is, verses 24 through 27. Here's the third servant. Actually, servant's a misnomer. He's not serving. He's not, he's not doing anything. He's making no effort. He invested in nothing. He didn't do, he gave no thought to serving his master. He didn't do what the master required. There's no fruit in his life. This is a picture of the person who's given the opportunity and the privilege of hearing the gospel. But they don't respond and they don't take advantage of it. He appears to be a servant. He appears to belong to the master's household. But there are two things that give him away. Two things that reveal the truth about him. The first one I just said, there's no fruit in his life. His life did not produce anything. And the second thing that gives him away is he attacks the character of the master. What does that mean? He didn't really know him. He didn't truly know the master as the other servants did. Look what he says in verse 24. You are a hard man. In the Greek, that's scleros. We get from that the word sclerosis. Hopefully you're not familiar with the term arteriosclerosis. What is that? It's a hardening of the heart, of the arteries around the heart. He said, you're, you're a hard man, you're unkind, you're, you're unforgiving, you're unrelenting, you're too tough, you're too demanding, you're too strict. I knew I couldn't please you, so, so I didn't even bother because you asked for too much. So he blames his failure for responding to the, the grace given to him, he blames it on God. Listen, does that happen in our culture today? Absolutely. Let me just tell you one simple way. You ever hear this when you're trying to tell someone about the faith and, and a God that's loving, compassionate, caring? Well, if God is so loving, how come? And you fill in the blank. They look at the hardness and the harshness of life, and they blame it on God, and they refuse the grace of the gospel. Now, look in verse 26. Understand, the master is not necessarily agreeing with this character assassination when he says you knew. It has more the sense of if you knew. He says, and listen, if you knew this, that's all the more reason you should have been compelled to do something to avoid my wrath. If you knew that I was a hard man, that I reap or I don't sow, you should have done something. By the way, God does have high standards. God does expect much of his followers. But the God who expects much of us never demands more than we can produce. And he empowers us. What he calls us to do and to produce, he empowers us to produce. Amen. Look what he says to him. You know, the very least you could have done is you could have put it in the bank. I mean, think about how foolish this guy was. What took more effort? Walking down the street and putting the money on deposit in the bank and avoiding the master's wrath. Maybe you didn't completely fulfill your obligation, but you did something. What takes more effort, going down the street to the bank or digging a hole and burying the money? He's just foolish. You know, what, you know what he's saying, what Jesus is saying here, what the master's saying? You didn't hide it because you're afraid of me. You were wicked and lazy. You were wicked 
and lazy because you knew me. You knew my nature. You knew what was required. And what you did was you pursued your own way and your own evil interest instead of doing what I called you to do. When what I offered you got in your way, you went the way of wickedness in your lazy lifestyle. So we see in the parable that true and, and false servants are revealed, their, their hearts revealed. This servant has hung around the master's house. He appears to be one of the master's faithful servants. But clearly, he's rejected the way of the master. So what happens? Look at the end here, verses 28 through 30. The servant loses the privilege, loses the opportunity he had. He ends up with nothing. And can I say, if you're here today and you've squandered the message of the gospel, you're very fortunate that grace can still be available. You're very fortunate that second chances can still be available. But a day is coming when there will not be a second chance. The day is coming when, when Christ returns and God sets everything in order and there will not be another opportunity. If you have squandered the message of the gospel, the offer of grace, you will no longer have opportunity. You'll be just like the servant. Where does he end up? He ends up in outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's the definition of hell. Darkness. What is darkness? It's the absence of a loving God. Weeping and gnashing in teeth. What's happening there? It's incredible pain because you realize that God is absent from your life forever and there is no hope. It's not just the physical pain in hell. It's the recognition that you had opportunity to have a loving, compassionate God, have a relation with him, and now there's no hope. It will never happen again and you'll be absent from him for all of eternity. Amen. There's a lot more to dig into here, but let me, let me see if I can land the plane. Two things. Number one. Obviously, this parable is a warning to those who don't know Christ. Listen, don't truly belong to Christ. You might be outwardly associated with Christ. You might know about him. You might hang around with people who know about him. You might talk to lingo. You might hang around his house all the time. But inwardly, you don't know him because you haven't responded to the grace that he's offered. You're just like this servant, just playing a game, being, being a faker. This parable tells us we need to examine our lives and ask, am I a true servant? Because if I'm a true servant, my life should be marked by fruit. What did James say? James says, show me your faith without works and I'll show you a faith that is dead. Do we work to earn our salvation? Absolutely not. But when we come to the master, when we surrender our lives and we become his followers, he gives us responsibility and there should be fruit from our lives as we fulfill those responsibilities. If there's no fruit, there's no faith. Just saying you have faith and just saying you know Jesus doesn't make it true. The majority of you here, and there are some here, as there are every Sunday, who don't know Christ, you're playing a game, and maybe you've even deceived yourself, and I appeal to you to hear what God's Word says, but the majority of you in here already know Christ. You've come to faith in Christ. So what does this parable say to a believer? What, what is this, how does this apply to us? Well, it's a reminder that we're to be at work. We're to be bearing fruit. As we wait for his return, we're not just to wait and enjoy life and enjoy the spiritual blessings we have. We're to be doing something with those things. We're to be bearing fruit, and we are going to be held accountable for the stewardship of our lives. Amen. Stewardship of what? Well, of our time and our abilities and our spiritual gifts and our blessings and our personality and our experiences and our attitudes and our material resources. By the way, stewardship is 100%. It's stewardship of everything. When the master came back, he didn't say to, to the five, hey, let me see what you did with 10% of what I gave you. That's not what he said. Stewardship of what God has given us. And listen, everything, even the breath that we breathe, everything we have is from God. Stewardship is a 100% deal. We're accountable for 100% of what God has blessed us with. Not 10, 100. Now I'm going to say a word about money. We are currently in an emphasis on tithing. A few folks have asked, and, and nothing wrong with them asking, they, they were concerned. A few folks have asked, are we, are we emphasizing tithing? Are we emphasizing giving because the church is in trouble? No. Does the church need, need your money? No. We trust what God provides through the ministry he's called us to, 
And yes, we want to do more. But our emphasis on tithing is not not out of a reaction to financial need. Our emphasis on tithing is that we're challenging you to tithe out of a response to the clear teaching of Scripture. As shepherds, the pastors of this church are shepherds. As shepherds called to lead, we want to lead you toward obedience and blessing. That's why we're emphasizing tithing. Now look, the the parable of talents, the passage we just read, is about a lot more than money. But isn't it interesting that Jesus didn't say... A certain man went on a journey, and he left to this one X amount of acres of his land and hold him to make sure it's productive while he was gone. It doesn't say a certain man went on a journey, and he left to this one a certain amount of his livestock and told him to care for the livestock and make sure that the livestock multiplied. He didn't say that. What did the man do? The man went on a journey, and he left what to his servants? Say it. Money. He left money. Now, why does Jesus use money in this parable? Because that's a foundational point of stewardship. None of what you have, your money, your possessions, none of it's yours, it all belongs to him. But can I tell you, if you're unwilling to simply tithe, then you have no concept over God's stewardship or over your stewardship of God's resources. They're his, they're not yours, they don't belong to you. He didn't give the servants the money, he gave them stewardship over the money, over what he had. Now, are you going to be cast out and cast into hell for not tithing? No. But you are going to be held accountable. All of us are going to be held accountable for, uh, I can't say our money, for his money. We're going to be accountable for everything that he's blessed us with and how we're serving him and the, the opportunities that he gives. We're going to be held accountable. And money is part of that accountability. You know, I thought this week, it seems like there are a lot of Christians now that, that, that practice, I'm, I'm going to call it passive spirituality. And that's really an oxymoron. Passive spirituality. We can't be passive in our faith and, and, and in our journey with Christ. A follower of Christ is serving. Faith without works is dead. A disciple of Christ understands that everything he has, even his very life, belongs to the master, and it's for the master's use, not not his own. That's what we're called to. That's what this this parable makes clear. And now the question is, what what about our obedience? The reason we, we have a time of response at the end of a message, at the end of a service, is we need to immediately make the decision that we're going to obey. Now, God may call you to do something through the teaching of his word that you can't get accomplished here in this room at this moment, but you can make the decision during that time of response, God, I have heard what you said, I am going to obey, and and the minute I walk out of here, the minute I walk into this situation or this place, wherever it is that I need to obey, I'm going to do that. The talents were given. And they went at once to fulfill the calling of the master. 